Rewind brings you Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce and the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. Those were the eagerly awaited announcements that throughout the 1940s introduced the radio adventures of Sherlock Holmes to American listeners. For alongside his appearances in books, plays and films, Sherlock Holmes was an undisputed star of radio. Radio has always been a particularly effective medium for evoking the Victorian world of Holmes and Watson. The clatter of horses' hooves on cobbled streets, the howl of the wind on lonely moors, and the sinister creaks and groans of ancient manor houses steeped in history and crime. With an adroit mixture of sound effects to underscore Doyle's vivid prose and memorable dialogue, the listener is well and truly launched on a voyage of the imagination. At the heart of this world is the voice of Sherlock Holmes. Everyone knows what Sherlock Holmes looked like. He was one of the great profiles of fiction, as Orson Welles reminded radio listeners in 1938. There are only a few of them, these permanent profiles, everlasting silhouettes on the edge of the world. Tonight we pay tribute to the most wonderful member of that most wonderful world, the tall gentleman with the hawk's face and the underslung pipe and the fore-and-aft cap, a gentleman who never lived and who will never die, Sherlock Holmes. But what did Sherlock Holmes sound like? I've donned my deer stalker and Inverness cape and I'm prepared to brave the hazards of the dustiest archives in search of that elusive quarry, the authentic voice of Sherlock Holmes. Where else to begin but with his creator, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle? With regard to Sherlock Holmes, I was, when I wrote it, a young doctor and had been educated in a very severe and critical medical school of thought especially coming under the influence of Dr. Bell of Edinburgh, who had most remarkable powers of observation. He prided himself that when he looked at a patient, he could tell not only their disease, but very often their occupation and place of residence. I thought I would try my hand at writing a story where the hero would treat crime as Dr. Bell treated disease, and where science would take the place of chance. But Doyle's son, Adrian, had a different view about the character's origins, as he told BBC radio listeners in 1945. Who was Sherlock Holmes? Since the death of my father, this question has often been renewed, and in this connection I regret to add that on one or two occasions some gratuitous nonsense has been written on the subject by persons possessing no factual knowledge whatever. I am in a position to answer the question very simply. Sherlock Holmes was Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. A man, he once wrote, cannot spin a character out of his own inner consciousness and make it really lifelike unless he has the possibilities of that character within himself. But more than the possibilities were here. Many cases that had baffled the police were brought to him, and I can recall no single instance in which my father failed to solve the problem. He proved the innocence of a man convicted of murder. Holmes himself had no more difficult test. Dr. Joseph Bell, his old mentor, did indeed help to develop those powers but the powers were innate, or no teacher could have stimulated them. The very accoutrements of Sherlock Holmes, the curved pipe, the dust-red dressing gown, were the accoutrements of Conan Doyle, and the family still preserved the originals. For the mental prototype of Sherlock Holmes, we need search no further than his creator. So should the authentic voice of Sherlock Holmes have a Scottish accent? Perhaps not. Doyle himself described Holmes's voice as quick, high, somewhat strident but early interpreters seem to have settled for a languid drawl. It's a remarkable fact that the first great interpreter of this quintessentially English character was an American, William Gillette. It was Gillette who gained permission from Conan Doyle in 1899 to create a Sherlock Holmes play out of the short stories, and for the next 30 years he toured both Britain and America in productions of the play. And Doyle's verdict? I was charmed both with the play, the acting and the pecuniary result, he wrote. And what was Gillette's contribution? David Stuart Davis is the editor of the Sherlock Holmes magazine and a noted Sherlockian. I suppose Gillette was instrumental in making Sherlock Holmes flesh for the readers of the Strand magazine and the Collier's magazine. He was the model for artist Frederick Dawes Steele, whose illustrations graced the pages of Collier's magazine. One remembers Booth Tarkington's comment that he would rather see William Gillette play Sherlock Holmes than be a child again on Christmas morning, which is a remarkable tribute. 
The sole recording of his voice remains a scene from his play Sherlock Holmes, specially recorded in 1936, when he was in his 80s. I merely refer to this in case you should see fit at some future time to chronicle the most important and far-reaching piece of work in my entire career, the case of Professor Robert Moriarty. Moriarty? I don't remember ever having heard of that fellow. The Napoleon of crime. The Napoleon. Sitting motionless like an ugly, venomous spider in the center of his web. But that web having a thousand radiations and the spider knowing every quiver of every one of them. And within 48 hours, we'll have the lines drawn so tightly around him that he can't move. We'll arrest him and his entire gang. Oh, Holmes, this is a very dangerous thing. My dear fellow, it's perfectly delightful. My whole life is spent in a series of frantic endeavors to escape from the dreary commonplaces of existence. It's quite difficult to uh, assess Gillette as Holmes now because there is little existing by which we can judge him. If we are to believe, and there is no reason not to, the adulation that he received for nearly 40 years playing Holmes, he must have had that extra special something. I suspect that we really needed to see as well as hear Gillette to appreciate his power as Sherlock Holmes. But Gillette was not only the first stage Holmes, he was the first radio Holmes too. For long before Holmes became a fixture on BBC Radio, he was an integral part of American radio schedules. Every year from 1930 to 1950, with the sole exceptions of the years 1937 and 1938, Sherlock Holmes appeared for 39 weeks a year on American radio. His American career was the inspiration of a remarkable woman, actress and playwright Edith Miser. It took her three years, but she eventually persuaded NBC to launch the first series of The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes on October the 30th, 1930. Over the next 13 years, she contributed 220 complete scripts, inventing her own stories when she'd exhausted the stock of Doyle originals. It was Edith Miser, too, who had the brilliant idea of casting in The Speckled Band, the first episode of the first ever Holmes radio series, the man most closely identified with the role, William Gillette. Following The Speckled Band, the role of Holmes on radio was taken from 1930 to 1936 by Richard Gordon, who gave him a voice that was reedy and querulous. The whole body is contorted and convulsed in a very paroxysm of fear. You've never seen death in this form before, Watson? Never. You know of no poison that would have this effect? Good heavens, no. You... Hmm, lamp is lit. It's been burning over an hour. Notice the oil consumed. And yet darkness only just set in. Did anyone call at the vicarage this afternoon? Uh, no, I was out myself, but my servant says he let no one in. Well, then uh, Tregenis was alone. I then. wonder. The window was shut at the time of his death, but the lamp was lit. Curious. Yes, yes, by Jove, I think I found something. What's that you're putting in your pocket, Holmes? The lamp, the lamp, of course, the lamp. Yeah, notice this powder which has been spilled in the face of the lamp. Red-brown powder. Give me an envelope, Watson. Give me an envelope. I must have suspect of the powder. But why are you so excited about the powder, Holmes? Because it contains a solution of our mystery, Watson. It is the source and the solution. Then, in 1938, the year after Gillette died, the Mercury Theatre on the Air presented a new Holmes. The role was undertaken by the then enfant terrible of the American stage, Orson Welles, just two years before he created his cinematic masterpiece, Citizen Kane. The amazing thing about the Welles broadcast is that he was only 23 at the time. And not only did he star as Holmes, but he had adapted the play as well. His Watson was Ray Collins, who appeared with him in Citizen Kane, who was nearly 50. Interestingly enough, the voice that Wells used to introduce the show, uh, his own, I suppose, natural, slightly actorish voice, was deeper and darker than the voice he used in the actual play itself, in the adaptation. This was light and smooth, not unlike a young James Mason, and he spoke brightly and quickly, as though this was a method of establishing his brilliance as a detective. Billy, the gentleman I'm carefully pointing out to you with his 45 desires to have us gather something of his left hand inside coat pocket. He's not feeling quite himself today, and the consequence of his trying to do it himself might prove fatal. I suggest you attend to it for him. Yes, sir. Is this it, sir? This gun? Uh, quite so. That's all, Billy. Still, I see if he's got another, sir. <laughs> Why, Billy, you've surprised me. Has the gentleman has taken the trouble to inform us that he hasn't? When, sir? When he made a snatch for this one. And now, Professor... So sorry. It's all, Billy. Thank you, sir. I came here this evening, Mr. Holmes, to 
to see if peace could not be arranged between mm, us. Quite so, quite so. You've seen fit not only to reject my proposals, but to make insulting references coupled with threats of arrest. You've been warned of your danger. You don't heed that warning. Perhaps you'll heed this. Up on your hands, Mr. Holmes. Up with the marriage. Oh. Didn't imagine I'd leave that gun loaded, did you, Professor Moriarty? But the golden age of Holmes on American radio was 1939 to 1946, the era of Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce. They'd made an enormous impact as Holmes and Watson in the 1939 film version of The Hound of the Baskervilles and its follow-up, The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes. They were immediately called upon to recreate the roles on radio and played them for the next eight years. From the movie standpoint, uh, Nigel Bruce was remarkable in the sense that he made Watson an equal partner with Holmes. And previous films had always presented Watson as a, an also-ran, uh, seen only briefly and playing no major part in the story. Now, this is partly due, I suppose, to the nature of the original tales, in which Watson often seems to be doing nothing, but, of course, he is telling the story. In dramatised versions, uh, Watson, the narrator, has to have a higher profile. So Bruce achieved that by being a comic foil, an older buffer type comic foil. Actually, despite being younger than Rathbone, he always looked and sounded much older. And the age difference was carried over into the radio shows. I'm Dr Watson and, and this is Mr Sherlock Holmes. How do you do, gentlemen? I must apologise for not giving my name to your housekeeper, but I have to be so careful. Yes, yes, we, we quite understand, my dear. Of course, you're wondering who I am and what's brought me here. My own theory would be that you are Miss Harriet Irving and that you've come to me to elicit my aid in proving that Mr. Binion did not murder your father. Holmes, what on earth are you talking about? You're absolutely correct, Mr. Holmes. But what? how did you know? I deduced it, Miss Irving. You're wearing very new and extremely expensive mourning, presumably for the first time, since a few basting threads are still in evidence. You wear no rings, so evidently you're not in mourning for a husband. The only man whose death the papers announced in the past few days and who left a young daughter uh, wealthy enough to purchase such garments is Sir Edward Irvin. And since the police have already made an arrest, obviously you wish me to uh, uh, disprove the police theory and intercede for young Binion. Mr. Holmes, you're wonderful. That's just what I want you to do. Rathbone had a brilliant, incisive, dark voice, uh, an ideal radio voice for Holmes, I think. But I suspect that the rehearsal time for these shows was short, and sometimes it shows in the sometimes shoddy delivery of the lines. And in the later programmes, Rathbone occasionally sounds bored and simply going through his paces. However, it's fair to say that Rathbone giving a perfunctory performance is usually head and shoulders above the rest. In 1946, Rathbone gave up the role. He was fearful that he was becoming typecast and felt he could do no more with the part. But Holmes carried on for another four years on American radio without him. First, there was Tom Conway, best known for his film role as the suave sleuth, The Falcon. His cultivated purr was distinctly different from Rathbone's whiplash. It's my opinion, Watson, based on experience, that the lowest and vilest alleys in London do not present a more dreadful record of sin than does the smiling countryside. What a morbid pub. The reason is obvious. The pressure of public opinion can do in the city what the law cannot accomplish. There's no lane so dark that the scream of a tortured child or the thud of a drunkard's blow does not obtain sympathy and help from some neighbour. But look at these lonely houses. Think of the deeds of hellish cruelty, the hidden wickedness, which may go on year in, year out in such places and no one the wiser. Upon my soul, Holmes, you're in a particularly depressing mood. Hello, hello, hello. Look at this fellow running towards us. Must be crazy. Imagine galloping along a towpath on a hot day like this. And from his expression, I think we may reasonably assume that he's not doing it for the exercise. Then there were radio actors John Stanley and Ben Wright before the series finally ended in 1950. Why was Sherlock Holmes so popular in America? American audiences, like the British, were enthralled by the lightning feats of deduction, the quirky characterization, the Victorian atmosphere, which by the troubled 1930s had come to seem reassuring, and the memorable one-liners. This, I think, is a three-pipe problem. It's a capital mistake to theorize before one has data. And, of course, the apocryphal. Elementary, my dear Watson. But there's more to it than that. Holmes and Watson were part of a shared Anglo-American culture which spanned the Atlantic. Doyle firmly believed in this shared heritage, 
and therefore so did Holmes, who says to Mr Francis Hay Moulton in The Noble Bachelor... It's always a joy to me to meet an American, Mr Moulton. I am one of those who believe that the folly of a monarch and the blundering of a minister in far gone years will not prevent our children from being some day citizens of the same worldwide country under a flag which will be a quartering of the Union Jack with the stars and stripes. An essential ingredient of this common culture was a commitment to chivalry and the idea of the perfect gentleman. Hollywood in its golden age cherished its gentlemanly British actors such as Ronald Coleman, David Niven and George Sanders who played respectively Bulldog Drummond, Raffles and The Saint. Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce, officers and gentlemen both having served with distinction in the Great War, where Rathbone won the Military Cross, brought authentic chivalric distinction to the roles of Holmes and Watson, those gallant modern paladins seeking to slay the dragons of cruelty and injustice. As television superseded radio in America, interest in Holmes and Watson waned. British radio, which had hitherto shown little interest, now took them up. In 1954, a celebrated theatrical pairing, Sir John Gielgud and Sir Ralph Richardson, took on the roles of Holmes and Watson for a 12-part BBC series. Hello. What's this? What's this, Watson? Someone in quite a remarkable state of agitation, Holmes. And whoever it is, he's not even waiting for Mrs Hudson's good offices. A man from his step. A young one from his energy. And a strong one from his tug on the bell pull. Mr. Holmes, I'm nearly mad. Oh, do sit down, won't you? Mr. Holmes, I am the unhappy John Hector McFarlane. I never quite liked Gilgood and Richardson as Holmes and Watson. One can imagine the, the sense of delight that the radio producer had at the time of getting two of the, the premier stage actors uh, to play Holmes and Watson. But both of them were not really ideal types for the characters they were playing. Um, both, really, too actorish, and certainly with Gielgud, um, it tended to move into the sort of Shakespearean declamatory tones when he was playing Holmes, and particularly when he was giving a, sort of a deduction or explaining something in detail. You mentioned your name as if I should recognise it, but I assure you I know nothing whatever about you, beyond the obvious facts that you're a bachelor, a solicitor and a Freemason. Mr Holmes... How on earth? Oh, you mustn't mind him, Mr. McFarlane. It looks like a conjuring trick, but it's really quite simple. Well, he deduced the first fact from the general untidiness of your tie, if I may say so, and the second from the sheaf of legal papers sticking out of your pocket there, and the third from the charm on your watch chain. Upon my soul, Watson, you improve. You do indeed. <laughs> well, thank you, Holmes. Despite the eminence of Gielgud and Richardson, it was two veteran radio actors who, for Holmes aficionados in the 1950s and 1960s, became the voices of Holmes and Watson. They were Carlton Hobbs and Norman Shelley. In a sense, they were carrying on the tradition set up by Rathbone and Bruce, with Watson sounding older than the capricious Holmes. But certainly, one could believe in their friendship which I think is an important thing and often forgotten by those writers who are adapting the stories. Hmm, it's, uh, it's quite an eloquent old hat. Oh? Here, take this lens. Yeah, yeah? You know my methods. Let's see what you can tell me about the man who's worn this hat. Oh, dear. Hmm. Well, there's uh, no maker's name. A sound opening gambit, Watson. <laughs> there's a uh, red silk lining, pretty as coloured, though. A lot of dust in the felt and um, spots or something. <laughs> yes, it looks as though he's been trying to cover some of the blemishes up with ink. Capital, my dear Watson. Otherwise, Holmes is just a very ordinary round black hat that's seen better days. Then tell me what you deduce. Deduce? Oh, Watson, you disappoint me. After such an admirable display of your powers of observation, too. <laughs> oh, well. Carlton Hobbs had a wonderfully strange voice. It was captivating, high, reedy, an alien. His laugh was just how I imagined Sherlock Holmes would laugh. Certainly there were echoes of how Doyle described his laugh in the stories. <laughs> Shelley had a, a rich, brown, chocolate pudding of a voice. Uh, he seemed to savour the words, almost rolling the phrases around in his mouth before releasing them slowly. Oh, well, come on, Holmes. Better tell me what I should have found. Very well. Uh, this is the hat of a highly intellectual, middle-aged man who's also been fairly well-to-do within the last three years, but has now fallen on evil days. Drink, probably. Yes, that would account for the obvious fact that his wife has ceased to love him. My dear Holmes, what on earth are you talking about? But he's retained some degree of self-respect. 
Oh, and it's extremely improbable that he has the gas laid on in his house. <laughs> Holmes, you're pulling my leg. Not in the least, Watson. Is it possible that even when I give you these results, you still can't see how they're attained? No, I'm blessed if I can. Enid Williams, who later went on to produce the entire canon for BBC Radio, was then a young studio manager, and she worked on some of the programmes. They were enchanting to work with, delightful, very different from each other. They were, of course, both already far too old to play the parts, but Hobbo had a wonderful, sensitive feeling for Holmes in, and brought a lot of the intellect to Holmes. Well, how, how do you know the man's an intellectual? See what happens when I try the hat on. It comes right down over my nose. <laughs> Cubic capacity, Watson. <laughs> so large a brain must have something in it. Well, what about the decline of his fortunes, then? This hat is three years old. This is one of the first of these flat brims curled at the edge. Uh, yeah. You notice the excellent lining. It's a hat of the very best quality. If this man could afford to buy it three years ago and he's still having to wear it in this state, then he's certainly gone down in the world. But his self-respect hasn't gone entirely because he's tried to cover up some of the stains with ink. Yes, that's what I said. We can tell he's middle-aged simply by examining the lining. You see, all these greying hair ends cut off recently by the barber. Yes, of course, but, um... His wife, you, you said she'd cease to love him. Ah, I'm afraid it's true. This hat hasn't been brushed for weeks. My dear Holmes, you've an answer for everything. But how on earth can you tell from a man's hat that he has no gas laid on in his house? Quite simply. One tallow stain or even two might have got onto the hat by chance. But when I see no less than five, I begin to picture him walking upstairs at night, probably with his hat in one hand and a guttering candle in the other. Satisfied? Ha, ha, ha. Oh, well, Holmes, it's all very ingenious. Remarkable. Norman, I think, really went more for the buffoon of Watson, but that was Norman's style, but it's it's a memory I always cherish, and, and of course, particularly with Hoppo, who was a, a great actor, and, and, of course, something that was very, very different then from now, a great radio actor, and that was a whole different style. Shh, shh. Listen. Quick, Watson, he's coming. Quickly and quietly, away from the window and into this corner. Yes. Our visitor won't see us here. Now, come along. They understood how to handle a microphone, what they could do to utterly make the audience believe that they were somewhere else and what the microphone could do with them with very, comparatively, very unsophisticated technology. And that's the end of you at last, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Oh, no, Colonel! Sherlock Holmes is still here! Hold on to him, Watson! For the last ten years, the BBC has been engaged on an ambitious plan to adapt all the novels and stories in the order of their first appearance. Clive Merrison and Michael Williams play Holmes and Watson. When we started with the adventures, we had no conception of how popular they were going to be. There was a possibility we would have done the adventures and that was that. But the audience took to them in the most incredible way. I still have in files literally hundreds of letters from people saying, this is so marvellous, when can we expect the next series and so on. And I produced every one of them and co-directed them with my very dear colleague Patrick Rayner, who normally works from Edinburgh. And because we wanted to be very authentic, and because Edinburgh has so many beautiful cobbled streets and so on. Patrick hired a handsome cab from some wonderful firm in Edinburgh that does that sort of thing. And so all the handsome cabs that you hear are absolutely genuine, done in the dead of night when there was no traffic about. The Church of St Monica, John. We must reach there before 12. Ma'am, up there! Well, there are a lot of things these days can be done on occasion. You cannot conceal London traffic or Concord going over or whatever it is. So we, we try and create the world in the studio. Good evening, Holmes. What? I was passing the door. Pray, come in. Thank you. Holmes's chair was always one particular side of the microphone and Watson's the other and they had their little tables and they knew physically as well as in their heads, what the geography was of 221B. 
They knew exactly where the window was, where the fire was, where their pipes were always laid out and the decanter and everything else. So they just, it was just home to them and they would get quite ratty if somebody would come along and say, no, I think your chair probably lives there. No, it doesn't. <laughs> oh, my dear fellow, how are you? <laughs> oh, I, I've been kept busy. I'm delighted to hear it. Take, take off your coat, Watson. <clears throat> Have a seat. Thank you. Hmm? Now, you'll join me in a drink. Oh, that would be very well done. My personal feeling is that both actors know where they're coming from and they know the background detail to the characters. But Merrison is not a very likeable Holmes. Um, the writers seem to have emphasised his coldness and his self-sufficiency. Williams, I like a lot. I think his voice reveals intelligence and the nobility of Watson and also a real love and respect for Holmes. But, unlike uh, Nigel Bruce, to a large extent, he is not a doormat. Wedlock suits you. You've put on seven and a half pounds since I saw you last. Seven. Just a trifle more, I fancy. Perhaps. You are back in practice, but your list is not yet a wrong one. Tonight you called on a patient in a prosperous household to which you travel by four-wheeler. You got yourself very wet lately, and you have a most clumsy and careless servant girl. Would you care for a whiskey? <laughs> <laughs> Clive has really totally flung himself in. In fact, he's most irritatingly absolutely Sherlock Holmes quite often, and we tease him about that greatly. And Watson was not the, the buffoon, as, for example, portrayed by... Nigel, I mean, Holmes would never have got him to live with him if he had been if he absolutely slaughtered each other. And I think that Michael most wonderfully gets that glorious, witty, because there's fun in it and wit, and his delight and pride in thinking that he has actually solved cases and he's got it all wrong is wonderful, but it comes from the mind of a man who is actually intelligent. And they've both realised their characters. I mean, they realise them... At the very beginning, they knew who they were playing. They both set out with a feel of the kinds of people that they were. And I think they really have achieved that. So we have reached the end of our quest. As the great man himself said, when you have excluded the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. And the truth is that we have not one Holmes voice, but a veritable speckled band of Holmeses. So whether you like your Holmes old or young, urgent or languid, emotional or intellectual, there is a voice for you. So settle down by the fireside, switch on your radio, and return to that permanently foggy and endlessly mysterious London of the 19th century, where the urgent cry, the game's afoot, means it's another case for Sherlock Holmes. As usual, Doctor, that was a swell story. That was The Radio Detectives, presented by Professor Geoffrey Richards, part of our crime spree this week here on BBC Seven. Now, we've got a real treat for fans of Sherlock Holmes for tomorrow night, a three-hour special examining the portrayal of Holmes and Watson on the radio from past to the present. <laughs>